Hey guys, it's uh, Sunny Brigham here. It's Tuesday. This is where we are always at on Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central Time. Um, I always think of like super stupid things to do and then I don't have the balls to do them on air, like uh, just stupid ways of, like I thought of doing a silly pose and then I was like, nope, I'm good. I'm good. I'm not going to do that. Okay, so it was pointed out to me that I am incessantly adjusting my camera. Yes, I'm always adjusting my camera, and this is why. So if it's, like, slightly crooked, I'm one of those people that, like, if you didn't cut the cake directly down the center in a perfectly straight line where the halves are perfectly even, that's all I can focus on is the fact that it wasn't cut perfectly down the center. So if the camera is, like, slightly off... That's all I will focus on the entire Facebook Live is the fact that the camera is not perfectly straight. So I spend a lot of time adjusting my camera before we start and sometimes afterwards. Um, so if you are joining me for the very first time tonight, my name is Sunny Brigham. I am a board certified clinical and integrative nutritionist, and I have a master's of science degree in clinical nutrition. I am located in the Fort Worth, Texas area. However, I do provide my services nationwide via HIPAA compliant uh, telehealth platform thingamajiggy. Um, and so tonight we are going to talk, uh, what are we going to talk about? I should probably know this. We, oh, I typed it. We're talking about leaky gut. There it is. That's what we're talking about. Um, and so I specialize in digestive health. That's one of, I specialize in digestive health and hormone balancing. And I do the two because quite honestly, <laughs> They tend to go hand in hand for most people. Not everyone, but most people, they tend to go hand in hand. So um, both of them are kind of along the same path, different therapeutic interventions, but one can throw out the other and vice versa. So that's kind of what I do. And I forgot where I was going with that. What was I saying? Oh, leaky gut, digestive health. That's what I do. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about uh, all things digestion, and I'm pointing at my digestive tract because a lot of it is in this area. Some of it's here, some of it's here, some of it's on the backside, but most of it's in here. Um, and so we're going to talk about leaky gut, and I know I've said that like three times, but I lost my train of thought. Um, and so we're going to talk about whether it's real because I'm in some science type groups on Facebook and I hear, you know, oh, leaky gut isn't a thing, yada, yada, yada. If you've watched any of my lives before, you know I'm 100% science-based. I love science, I love science, and I love science even more. Um, I'm all about uh, referencing reviews, which are the best, you know, peer reviewed, the best kind of study out there. Um, and so I did that in a lot of my, um, in the blog this week. So if you haven't read the associated blog, I did link it there. Wherever it shows up for you guys, I don't know if it's top, bottom, side, left, it's there somewhere. You just might, it's like a game, hunt and find it. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to read the blog yet, I would definitely go ahead and, after I'm done talking maybe, um, go and read the blog because uh, you might learn something new. Um, while I'm talking, if you have any questions, if something pops into your head and you're like, oh, hey, I got a question about this, just type it out and uh, I will make sure that I answer all the posted questions before I finish this live. Um, and yeah, so let's get to it. So, oh, I spent an ungodly amount of time on Ancestry.com today. That was pretty interesting. It's like a rabbit hole you can't get yourself out of. You go into it, and then you got to go more, and then you got to see the other side. Uh, so it was pretty interesting. I learned that uh, in the 1840s, on my father's father's side, we came from Bavaria, and then I learned in 1850 on my father's mother's side, we came from Hamburg, so uh, a lot of German there. Um, and then, oh, what else did I learn? On my, my mother's father's side, so my mother's father's side in the early 1800s, uh, my grandfather and grandmother both immigrated from Ireland. So uh, as my husband said, that's where I get my ridiculously pale skin because I'm Irish and German. Um, and he also said that's where I get my super sternness and my very mean, frank, and to the point attitude um, is from the Germans. I don't know what that means, but apparently I'm mean. I don't see it. Um, all right, so let's get to it. So is leaky gut real? Um, I'll just go ahead and tell you right now, absolutely it is. Um, there are a lot of people that say, no, it's not, but you can Google uh, 
intestinal hyperpermeability or intestinal permeability, and you will find study after study after study after study linking intestinal permeability, increased permeability, decreased permeability to various diseases out there. And we're going to talk about some of those tonight. Um, so let's see. So surprisingly, leaky gut is actually a very common um, thing. It's something that I see a lot of people have, and a lot of people have it and no, have no clue that they have it. They typically come to me and complain of uh, cons like consistent bloating, um, skin problems, whether that's like atopic dermatitis or long-term eczema, uh, seasonal allergies, although most people don't complain about that. They just assume it's something that they have to live with. Um, Let's see, other thing, either excessive diarrhea or excessive constipation or maybe teetering between one and the other, um, but usually bloat, heartburn, um, slow bowels, those are kind of the biggest ones. Inability to lose weight is right up there with all of them, and that's probably the number one reason that people come to see me is because they cannot lose weight. Um, and at the end of the day, it's not always what you're putting in your mouth, for a lot of people, it's repairing some of the systems on the inside that have been damaged over time. And so we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, okay, okay, we talked about that. We hit that. Okay, so the gastrointestinal tract or the digestive tract or the gut or whatever you wanna call it, I typically just re refer to it as the gut, starts at the mouth, goes all the way through the body and ends out the back. Um, it's actually external to the body. A lot of people don't realize that. It is a giant tube running from the inside to the exit. Um, and so most of the stuff that you put in your body does not actually get out into the bloodstream. It doesn't hit the rest of the body. So the digestive tract is there to break down, digest, and absorb the nutrients into your bloodstream and then excrete all the waste or fiber or things like that, kind of keep things moving along through the process. Um, but what happens is over time, we are creating a lot of inflammation in the body based on the lifestyle that we live, the environment that we survive in, and the foods that we're eating. Um, so I have my notes here to keep me on track because this is a conversation that I could go off on a massive tangent on and nobody has that kind of time tonight. Um, so the main purpose of the digestive tract, like I said, is really to break down and absorb your nutrients. So when we talk about digestion, most people do not think about their immune system. They don't think about immune health. They think, oh, you know, I'm just going to eat my food. They don't really think about the immune system at all. But in reality, the two are really closely tied together. So between 70 and 80% of your immune system lies within the small intestine. Now, when it comes to food absorption, nutrient absorption, um, digestion and breakdown, that's where the magic happens is in the small intestine. So the stomach, it kind of, you know, cleaves all the proteins and the B vitamins. It turns the food into like the smush they call chyme. And then it goes into the small intestine. And then that's where the digestive enzymes come and it starts to really break down all the nutrient particles and then absorb it out into the body from the small intestine. You hit the large intestine, things ferment um, in that area. That's why people tend to get gas from food. Not always a bad thing. Uh, feeding the probiotic or the, you know, the good healthy bacteria in the small intestine and then you excrete the waste. Um, but immune, the immune system and your digestive tract are very closely related because like I said, 70 to 80% of your immune system lies within the small intestine. Um, and so it's there for a purpose, right? Because we are continually introducing things into our system through this hole right here on our face. You know, we're putting in food. We're not always washing our hands before we're eating. We're maybe not eating the best well-prepared foods or the cleanest of foods. Um, and so we're constantly taking on pathogens and toxins and, you know, little critters and things like that on our food. And so we put it in our body, gets down, uh, hydrochloric acid will help to neutralize some of it. Things still can tend to get through. And so they get through into the small intestine and the immune system goes, hold up guys, we've got something in here that's not supposed to be here. Let's go ahead and evac activate the immune system. We're gonna attack this critter, let's neutralize it, and then we'll carry on with business. 
Um, and so that's all great. It's doing what it's supposed to do. But if we are continually activating the immune system over and over and over and over and over again, which a lot of people are, we tend to create an overactive immune system. Overactive immune system can lead to uh, eventually the body to start attacking itself. It's called an autoimmune disease. Um, and so that's not, immune system's good. Too much of it, not so good. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything here. Mm -hmm. Tight junctions. Yep, we're not going to talk about that. Um, so I always tell, like when I'm explaining this in my office, I usually tell people. So if you imagine, and this is a super duper 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 watered down explanation, but if you uh, imagine, you know, you get a cut on the surface, right? A cut on your skin. Um, and that's a pretty significant cut. Uh, what happens is the immune system activates to the site and the blood clotting factors come and they create this awesome little barrier, you know, and they scab so that other critters and things like that can't get inside. But the immune system is causing all of this to happen. And you've got um, the innate immune system, which happens, you know, right away. And then you've got the adaptive that comes five to seven days later, depending on what else needs to be done to that area. But the swelling that you get with it and the pain, that's all meant, that it's there for a purpose. It's there to prevent further injury. It's there to protect it um, from anything getting in. But you've got all that swelling that's happening in the pain. And if you think about that, you think, so our body is lined with skin cells. They're epithelial cells. So the small intestine is lined with the exact same thing. So it's lined with epithelial cells. And if you think about what's happening on the surface of the skin whenever you get a cut, that same thing is happening within the small intestine when we continue to introduce things that aggravate it. That can be additives in our food. That's a big thing. Preservatives in the food, that's another big thing. And then there are top, like very common foods that people tend to have issues with. Um, the top, so you can take in a food, uh, you can take it in over and over and over and over and over again, and your body sees it as an issue. So every time you consume this food, your body attacks that food, and it creates this inflammation in the small intestine because it's activating the immune system. And so your tight junctions start to loosen up. So the tight junctions, if you kind of picture them, they're kind of like this, they're really small openings, and it's meant for nutrients and things like that to get into the bloodstream. But when you've got the swelling on the surface of the skin and the swelling in the small intestine, those tight junctions are now failing. They're coming, they're becoming bigger and they're allowing for particles that were never meant to get into the uh, bloodstream that are now kind of out there free floating the body. Like, ooh, look where I got, guys. It's all your additives and preservatives on your food, um, not to mention particles in the air that we're breathing in now that are kind of making it into the body. Um, and then foods that are aggravating to a specific person's system. So everybody tends to have a little bit of different food sensitivities. Um, some people have very few and don't really have an issue with many of the foods that they consume. Some people have a lot of sensitivities and some people have a lot of allergies, like life-threatening food allergies, um, that their immune system is kind of responding to anytime they, they consume those foods. So they really have to abstain from those, you know, like peanuts is a common one, soy is another common one, um, but we can have food sensitivities. And this kind of goes along with leaky gut where a lot of people don't believe that food sensitivities are a real thing, but actually they've proven that it are because they have shown over and over again, you can actually have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So it used to be thought that you only had to abstain from gluten if you, were, if you had celiac disease. And that's actually not the case. It doesn't mean everybody has to abstain from gluten, but there are people that do not have celiac disease, but do have a gluten intolerance. And so there are some other foods kind of along that line as well. Some of the common food aggravators that we see often, sugar is a big one. Sugar is a very, very big one. Um, not to say that you can't ever have sugar. It's just one of those things that we should probably limit. Corn is another one. I see corn is a common aggravator for a lot of people. Um, gluten, actually corn is a big one for me. It will cause me to bloat like nobody's business immediately after I consume it. Um, gluten is another one. Gluten grains can be found in wheat, spelt, barley, rye, a couple of other ones, but those are the common ones. Um, caffeine, so coffee, tea, and chocolate. Beef, pork, soy, processed meats like um, sausages and hot dogs and lunch meats and those sorts of things. Dairy, dairy is a pretty common one. People notice when they take out dairy. 
Uh, if they go even, you know, three to four days without dairy and then they have it again, they'll notice they have some bowel upset. Um, and then eggs. Eggs is super common. Um, and people don't want to give up their eggs. Um, and I don't require everybody to give up their eggs. By all means, don't think that. Um, but actually, the egg whites is pretty aggravating to quite a few people. So I have a lot of clients that do have issues with egg whites. And once we're able to identify, yes, the egg whites is the problem, we can cut out the eggs, and then they start to feel a little bit better. I feel like I'm talking all that speed I took before. I'm just kidding. I don't do speed. Or do I? Okay, so the immune system and autoimmunity. So we know that there's an underlying genetic component, com, component, component to autoimmune development. So common autoimmune disorders, type 1 diabetes, celiac disease, uh, lupus is another one, irritable bowel disease, which is uh, comprised of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Those are autoimmune conditions, autoimmune thyroiditis, so Hashimoto's is the other name for it, or um, Graves' disease is the autoimmune portion of hyperthyroidism. Uh, lupus, I think I already said that one, sarcoidosis, that's another autoimmune condi condition. So there's lots of autoimmune conditions out there. And we know that there is an underlying genetic component, but what we also know is that only 10% of those people that carry the uh, genetic component for an autoimmune condition actually go on to develop that autoimmune condition. And so they tried to kind of dig and figure out why these 10% are kind of being affected. And when it came down to, it was environmental factors. So external factors that cause the activation of those genes. And I've talked about this in several um, Facebook Lives before that you can have a gene that says that you are basically susceptible to X, Y, or Z, but that gene is not necessarily expressed. It's how you lead your life, how you live, how you eat, how you um, maintain your overall health that will determine whether or not that gene is gonna be expressed. And so the same thing comes with autoimmune conditions. Um, so environmental is not just the air that we breathe or the location that we live. It's all about the food that we put in, um, how much we're exercising, how much stress we have in our life, all those sorts of things. Um, and all of those can lead to increased gut permeability, aka leaky gut. Um, so not only is leaky gut present in those with celiac disease, it's actually present in all the other autoimmune conditions that I talked about. Um, so all autoimmune conditions are actually on the rise. Um, and there is some debate on that. So yes, diagnosis of autoimmune conditions is on the rise. They don't know if it's because they are becoming more prevalent today than they were, you know, 30, 40 years ago, or is it because we have better diagnostic tools and so we're able to kind of pick and, you know, pick out these autoimmune conditions much sooner or faster in these people. Um, or if we are actually identifying more autoimmune conditions than we had, you know, 40 or 50 years ago. I think we used to only have two or three autoimmune conditions, and now we have so many. Um, and I only listed like a handful. I want to say that there's 30, 33, 34 suspected autoimmune conditions out there. Um, so anyway, so all autoimmune conditions have the component, uh, aside from the genetic link, they all have leaky gut as a uh, piece of the puzzle. Um, let's see, so, 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 so overactivation, food additives, and it's been found that various food additives as well as sugar and gluten um, also cause leaky gut. So I cited all these studies in here. You can just go in and kind of click the link and find them if you really want to read them. Um, so let's talk about symptoms. So yes, Every time we activate our immune system, it's there for a reason, it's there for a purpose, it's a good thing. We want the immune system healthy and well to combat any critters that we come in contact with, whether it's bacteria, viruses, any pathogens that we're putting in our body based on what's on the food. Um, but overactivation of the immune system, meaning that, so we talked about how corn is a problem for me, and I know that corn's a problem for me. Eventually, I would stop feeling that ridiculous, like massive blow every time I ate um, corn. And it's not necessarily that I wouldn't stop feeling it, it's just something I would become used to. I would think this is how I'm supposed to feel after I eat. And if I continue to consume corn every day, several times a day, I would continue to cause my immune system to activate and activate and activate and activate. Um, and it would cause an issue to where eventually I could develop an autoimmune condition. Um, I don't know 
if I have any uh, autoimmune type genetic component things. Um, no, actually, I take that back. I do have uh, multiple sclerosis genetic component, which is also an autoimmune condition. Um, but so if I continue to not take care of myself, there's always the chance that I am, or the risks that I'm taking by doing that, by developing, you know, one of these autoimmune conditions. Aside from that, I would still be developing leaky gut, which comes with a whole slew of symptoms and issues and problems in the body before you even get to an autoimmune condition. Um, so let's kind of talk about these symptoms real quick. Um, like I said, nobody really comes into me and they're like, I think I have leaky gut. Can you help me? Some do, some day say, like, oh, I've read about this on the internet. What do you think? It really kind of sounds like what I have. Um, and some people are just like, I want to lose weight. I can't figure out why I want to lose weight. I feel like crud, and I don't know what's going on. And so once we kind of go through the symptom questionnaire, and I ask a whole buttload of questions, and then we sometimes we'll do some testing and figure out that they probably have some leaky gut going on. And so we want to make sure that we repair that so that the rest of their goals can come to fruition. Um, and so sometimes people will come and they'll say, uh, when we start kind of looking at symptoms and kind of breaking the body down and seeing what's going on here and what they're feeling here and what's this all about and why did they write this down, a lot of people will dismiss a lot of their symptoms. Um, and they'll say, oh, that's uh, hereditary. I've had that, you know, or, oh, I started having seasonal allergies when I was 14 or 15 because, you know, I just live here and that's what happens. Most people just get, you know, seasonal allergies at some point in their life. Um, or I just thought, you know, bloating was normal, or I thought that my stool consistency was normal, um, and that's okay. You know, that's not, there's no problem with that. That's why they come to somebody that knows all about digestive health so that I can help them realize that these symptoms are not normal. What's happening is not normal, and this is why you're either gaining weight, you're feeling like crud, you can't sleep, or you're just exhausted all the time. Um, and then we start to repair the processes. And usually within a couple weeks, people start to feel amazing. Um, so it repairs pretty quickly, but it's kind of a long-term uh, healing process. It's not something you can just go like, oh, all right, I'm healed. I'm going to go back to eating whatever I want. Once you have it, you really have to kind of nurture it. But you learn a lot of things along the way about your body and what to look for for symptoms and things like that. So let's talk about like the common symptoms that I see. Uh, eczema. And when I say eczema, I'm not talking about eczema that was developed in infancy or as a toddler because those tend to be related to other issues. Um, but if you're, you know, let's say I'm 30-something and all of a sudden I get like a flare-up in eczema and I've never had eczema before, that's a good indication that there's something going on. Um, even if you're a teenager and all of a sudden you get eczema or if you're in your 20s and you all of a sudden you get eczema or atomic dermatitis or some other type of skin condition, um, that's a good indication there's something going on with the immune system in the small intestine, specifically with the gut. Um, tendency to seasonal allergies. And again, I'm not talking about the ones that you've had since you were an infant or, you know, you were four or five years old and you've had to take allergy meds your entire life. That's not the kind of seasonal allergies I'm talking about. I'm talking about the ones where you know, you develop them as a teenager or you develop them in your 20s or 30s or something like that or just out of nowhere, you never had any allergies whatsoever. And then like all of a sudden you have to take a Claritin or something all the time because you're getting the itchy, watery eyes, the sneezing, the runny nose, those sorts of things. So if it's just kind of like you developed it out of nowhere, you don't really know what's going on, that's a good indication. Uh, bloat specifically, and I put unexplained bloat because it's kind of common for women to bloat one to two times a month. Sometimes we'll bloat around ovulation, but usually we'll bloat around the menstrual cycle. So that's not unexplained bloating. If you went to the Golden Corral and you made sure that you got your $14.99 worth by like really stuffing yourself and you have to like either wear elastic pants or start unbuttoning those suckers before you leave the restaurant, that's not really unexplained bloat either. I'm talking like you just had a meal, maybe something you have fairly often, and you were feeling fine, but now all of a sudden, like, you feel a lot of pressure in your stomach, and it hurts, and it hurts to bend over, and you're not really certain where this bloat kind of came from. It kind of came out of nowhere. That's uh, unexplained bloating. Uh, unexplained diarrhea constipation. Um, if you have recently traveled and you have diarrhea, that's probably not unexplained diarrhea. If you picked up a virus somewhere, um, if you normally have really good stools and then 
out of nowhere just had diarrhea one day and then everything went back to normal, that's probably okay. But if it's like either consistent diarrhea or at least a couple times a week you're having it or maybe you eat something and you have diarrhea soon after you eat that, that's a good indication you've got something going on there. The exact same thing with constipation as well. Um, being sickly or never getting sick. So kind of two ends of the spectrum when it comes to the immune system. And it's because of either the immune system is failing us or because we have excessive overactivation of it. So if you're going like, you know, years without really getting sick or all of a sudden like you feel like you're sick all the time, those are good indications. Like I used to for some, like, and I think, I don't know, maybe I just have bad lungs. I have asthma now. I used to get bronchitis. Every year I would get a bronch, like a bronchial infection. Without fail, every year I would get a, uh, infection that would start in my nose, it would go down to my throat, end up in my chest, I would have a really hard time breathing. And it happened at least once a year, and that probably went on for five or six years. And then all of a sudden it just stopped. Like out of nowhere, I never got another bronchial infection, and I went years without getting sick. And I just thought, damn, my immune system is great. Like it never occurred to me that there was probably something going on and that's the same thing that happens with a lot of other people is they just think, I don't ever get sick. I'm just one of those people that have a really good immune system. Um, and you could have a really good immune system, but you also could have a very overactivated immune system, um, which is not a good thing. Fatigue. Oh, fatigue is a huge one. Brain fog is another really big one. Um, obesity and weight loss resistance. So those are really big ones. Um, and like I said, most people come to my clinic because they're like, I can't lose weight. I need help losing weight. Um, but really it's not like I look at their food log and I'm like, your diet's pretty good. Like there's not, I mean, there's some things we could tweak here and there, but for the most part, it looks really good. Uh, but they're sitting in front of me and they feel like, you know, they put on 10 to 15 pounds or, um, you know, they have this bloating or they have diarrhea. And so a lot of it comes from where you need to spend some time healing the digestive tract, getting it functioning where it's supposed to again. Um, so things that I typically do in my office is... We kind of do one of two things. And so I will either do what's called an elimination diet or I will do food sensitivity testing. And I kind of present both options to my clients. So the upside to uh, elimination diet is it's 100% free. It costs you nothing to do it. Um, but what you do is you basically go on a super restrictive diet for three to six weeks at a minimum. Sometimes it's more than that until we're certain that everything's kind of healed. You're functioning. You're feeling great. You're starting to lose weight. The bloat's gone. You're feeling really good again. We stay there until all of your symptoms subside, and then we add a food back in one at a time. Uh, some people like to do once every 48 hours or once every four days. I really like to kind of stretch that a little bit and do once a week because we have a delayed immune activation response to some foods that can come on around day four to five. And if we're introducing foods too quick, we're never gonna catch that delayed reaction. Um, and so it takes a long time to kind of get through that process and it can be super frustrating, but again, it's free. Um, and then the other uh, side that we'll do is food sensitivity testing. It's a blood test that we do. I give them the kit, I send them to the lab, they do the draw. Um, and we find out exactly what they are um, reacting to, exactly what foods their body doesn't agree with. We remove those foods, add in a series of supported supplements to really aid in the healing process of the digestive tract. And again, usually within, if you're following it, you know, to a T, usually within a couple of weeks, you're going to feel really good and you're going to start going to, you're, you're going to start to feel back to your old self. Um, kind of some caveats to that though is, when you're really looking at healing the gut, you really have to look at uh, like changing your overall lifestyle because if you are overstressed, you're going to continue to cause some gut damage. So really looking at the stress in your life and repairing the stress that's there um, because it's, stress is just one of those things that if you don't, if you don't fix it, if you don't address it, it's going to ruin the body. Um, and so really taking a look at the stress that's going to affect the gut. Um, so you can do everything diet wise, but if the stress is there, it's not really going to get anything better until the stress is addressed. Um, if you are still consuming these foods, but you're taking the supplements, you may not always, you might feel a little bit better, but you're still activating the immune system. So the whole goal is to take out what's causing the problem, 
heal the body. And then over time, you can add those foods back in. Doesn't mean that you can't ever have them. It just means it's really like a mod, like a no, like no kidding moderation type food. Um, and so that is it. I never, ever, ever recommend anybody do any gut healing on their own. Um, you can really cause some problems. Um, you can introduce foods too quickly and never really know if you are uh, activating to that specific food. Um, and so I always recommend reaching out to somebody that specializes in digestive health, if not me, if somebody else that does the same thing, um, to really kind of guide you along the way. Because sometimes it could be something greater than just leaky gut. It could be, you know, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or, you know, you could have an autoimmune condition and all of that will need to be addressed appropriately. So that's my spiel. Let's see. Uh, oh, hi, Sandra said hello. I think that's it. I didn't have any questions. If there's any questions, um, you guys are more than welcome to post. If you're watching this after the fact, by all means, go ahead and post your questions. I do monitor them, and I will be more than happy to come back in and answer those for me, for you. I'm not answering them for me. I'm answering them for you. Yeah. Okay. So that's what we're doing. Um, and then that's it. So I will see you guys next week. If you haven't had a chance to read the blog yet, I highly recommend that you go do that. Um, and next week we're going to talk about foods that boost the HDL. That's what we're in. HDL is good cholesterol. Um, and so join me. It's every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central. And uh, I save these. So if you miss it, you can always come back and look at them. So with that, I'll see you guys next week. Bye.